Hey, hey, come on in, pull up a chair. You came in during happy hours, there's plenty of goodies for you. We're going to be looking at one of the inspirations for the Colonel's Bequest, the Agatha Christie murder mysteries in Laura's lineages. We'll be exploring the depths of Lillian's troubled mind in altered states. And we'll have our eye on the Prune family, Ethel and Lillian, in Meet the Cast. I do want to address one thing before we begin this section. You may notice that we almost always begin after hours with the many deaths of Laura Bell. Now, we're not entirely out of deaths for the game. We're certainly down to the last few, but there's a couple in store. The problem is, these deaths would be spoilers if they happen now. So we're just going to have to wait an act or two, and then we'll get to see everything. So don't worry, that section's coming back. But for now, let's take a look at one of the inspirations, possibly the main inspiration for the events of The Colonel's Bequest, the novels of Agatha Christie. Dame Agatha Mary Clarissa Christie was a British crime writer. She wrote novels, short stories, and plays, uh, also some romances under a pen name, but she's mostly remembered for her work in the detective area. She actually wrote 66 detective novels and more than 15 short story collections, and is the best-selling novelist of all time, having sold roughly 4 billion copies. She is the most translated individual author, and her works have been translated into at least 103 different languages. She tended to write fairly complex plot lines involving murder, which featured large casts, many or all of whom had a significant motive or reason to commit the murder. In them, a detective would gather the evidence, piece together a theory as to who committed the crime, and eventually expose the murderer. The only real difference between a general Christie plotline and what happens tonight is that Laura, while certainly curious and investigative, isn't portrayed as being particularly brilliant. Christie's two most famous detectives were probably Hercule Poirot, a rotund Belgian man who solved crimes with his brain and certainly not with his physical abilities, and Mrs. Jane Marple, an elderly woman who did the same. Her heroes did not tend to be physically imposing, and they had to rely on their wits to get them out of sticky situations, again, paralleling Laura Bow. She was first married to Archibald Christie in 1914 on Christmas Eve. He was an aviator in the Royal Flying Corps. That was during World War I. Her husband was offered a job organizing a world tour to promote a British Empire exposition, and the couple traveled the world interestingly, becoming some of the first British people to surf standing up. Agatha Christie published her first mystery novel, The Mysterious Affair at Styles, in 1920, and unfortunately, her marriage was broken up by 1926, when it was revealed that her husband had been inf- unfaithful to her for some time. At this point in time, she simply disappeared, leaving a sort of mysterious note behind her. There was a massive public outcry to find her, and she was finally discovered at essentially a spa, the Swan Hydropathic Hotel, about 11 days later. There was a massive and negative public outcry at this. Some people thought it was a publicity stunt. Other people thought that she was trying to pretend to be dead, possibly even to frame her ex-husband. Regardless, she continued writing, and had soon recaptured the public eye. As I mentioned before, her books tended to follow a particular plotline. These were, in fact, incredibly formulaic. They were whodunits, focusing on the British middle and upper classes. The detective does not seek out the crimes, usually, uh, but stumbles across them, or is hired to investigate the crimes by an old acquaintance. The detective will generally interrogate each suspect, examine the scene of the crime, notice all the clues, And about halfway through, or sometimes even in the final act, one of the suspects dies, usually because they have, in some way, deduced or stumbled upon the killer. The murders tend to be fairly ingenious, using some very convoluted piece of deception that only the brilliant detective could have seen through. And our current story bears some similarity to another of Christie's most famous novels, And Then There Were None, also called Ten Little Indians. In this book, the characters are called to a remote island where they are all trapped for the night, They begin to perish one by one, and they begin hunting for the identity of the killer. The major difference between the colonel's bequest and that is that everyone knows that people are dying throughout the whole of Ten Little Indians. There's not really any confusion as to if they're just sleeping or if they've gone away or something like that. People who criticize Christie usually say that her books were too formulaic or that they used too many stereotypes, and it's certainly true that she was stereotypical of non-British people. 
Mediterraneans, especially Italians, Jews, people from Africa, all of these find fairly stereotypical roles inside of her books. This could also be reflected in the French coquette Fifi, the warm but fairly no-nonsense African-American cook Seely, and the slimy lawyer Clarence. Christie also had an intense interest in history, especially family legacies, and we can see this reflected in the story of the Croutons and the Dijons. So, all in all, the Colonel's Bequest would have made a good addition, and certainly would have been a good fit, into the repertoire of Dame Agatha Christie. I personally recommend that you pick up one or two of her books. They are a little formulaic, and some of the stereotypes are a little bit blunt, but I found them to be enjoyable reading. I've probably plowed through two dozen of the things in my life, and I've enjoyed them. It's not what I'd call especially deep writing, but it's pretty enjoyable, and the psychological thrills keep you coming back. I hope you've enjoyed the quick foray into the world of Agatha Christie. Most of the characters in The Colonel's Bequest have one particular reason we would suspect them of murder. Clarence has a ton of debt, Rudy has an anger problem and also some debt, Ethel is really drunk, and so on. But Lillian's reason, and I'm pretty sure this is not a spoiler by this point in time, is that she is crazy. She's just completely crazy. And to find out how crazy, and in what way, I was able to get an interview with a professor of psychology at the local university, one who specializes in abnormal mental states. I sat down and described the background and actions of Lillian during the night, and asked them how they would diagnose Lillian if they were given them as a patient. The results were somewhat surprising to me. I'll be honest, I really expected Lillian's portrayal in this game to be sort of Hollywood crazy. In other words, entertaining to look at, but not very realistic. What I found, though, was that Lillian's portrayal might well be a fairly accurate case of Dissociative Personality Disorder, better known as Multiple Personality Disorder. Now, this is never acknowledged in-game. They never actually go into specifically what her, her problem was for being crazy, but it seems to fit the facts fairly well. Multiple personality disorder, disassociative personality disorder, occurs when there is more than one personality types or personalities that a person develops. In a way, it's like multiple people living in the same body. This is more common among women than it is among men, and it's especially common when there's been a traumatic childhood. Lillian certainly fits the bill as far as that goes, with her father committing suicide and her mother being alcoholic and basically non-caring. We can even see some clues throughout the night that this might be what's going on. I had originally assumed that when we catch Lillian in the playhouse playing with dolls, that had been regression to some kind of a childhood state, and in a way it might have been. It could be that one of Lillian's personalities was childish, that in order to relive happy memories from her past, or to protect the rest of her mind from unpleasant events, sometimes her brain regresses her into a childhood state. At least in some cases, it's thought that multiple personality disorder occurs in response to extremely traumatic events, where the mind essentially protects itself by fracturing into a number of different personalities, each of which are useful in some way to the main personality. So, in other words, say in Lillian's case, it could be that the childish personality is useful when Lillian is feeling extremely overwhelmed and nostalgic for the past, that in a way, she can actually relive that past through the personality. This would also explain how minutes later, 15 minutes later, you'll find her being perfectly fine wandering about the mansion and making small talk with you. There's no set number or kind of personalities that can occur in multiple personality disorder. There can be anywhere from two to many dozen, and they can include all kind of genders, ages. There can even be different species. Some people's personalities will even include animals. They might suddenly start walking around and barking like a dog. Different personalities will have different names associated with them. If we really wanted to give the writers a lot of credit, we might say that that is one possible explanation for why you were unable to talk to Lillian when she's in her room, but you were able to talk and Lillian answers. It's because that personality at that time was not in fact Lillian. There will typically be one main personality and a variety of sub-personalities. The sub-personalities will be aware of each other and of the main personality, but the main personality will not be aware of the sub-personalities. So what this is getting at is, if Lillian is in fact the murderer, it's very likely that one of her personalities is extremely violent, or at least willing to use violent ends to accomplish its means, and the main character, Lillian, when she's just chatting with you or talking to her uncle, is totally unaware that she has been doing these terrible things. It's also worth noting that subpersonalities can have completely different outlooks on life and even moralities than the main personality. 
So it's possible that the Lillian we know may be non-violent and amiable, whereas one of the sub-personalities might be vicious and violent. Now, the one thing we do have to say is that Lillian is never... Lillian never asks to be addressed as anything except Lillian. There's never any indication that she is, in fact, a different personality um, inhabiting the same body. However, the facts of the disorder certainly do seem to fit the facts of the evening. So... Assuming that this is correct, I have to give the writers props, because this is one place where I figured that they'd just essentially been lazy, and in fact, it, it at least might have been, at least coincidentally was, a fairly deep and accurate portrayal of a certain variety of mental illness. Alright, well a big thank you out to the professor who furnished that information, and let's get on with it. So, one group that we haven't taken a look at yet on the plantation tonight are the Prunes, Ethel and Lillian. Ethel is Henri's younger sister, and one of the few people that he's described as having feelings for. Fifi says that he is made very sad by the fact that Ethel drinks, and although he never admits this to you, although he doesn't really talk to you much at all, it can be surmised that he has at least some feelings for his younger sister. If we remember, he also points out to Lillian that he essentially looked after her when she was a kid just to try to help out Ethel. Ethel is portrayed during the events of the night as essentially a drunk, and that's about it. That one facet sort of overtakes her personality. And to be fair, she is so drunk for most of the night that she can't really talk correctly or stand up, and spent most of the time before her untimely death just sort of moonwalking in circles around the plantation house. It is suggested that she wasn't always this way, that about 12 years ago her husband, for unknown reasons, committed suicide, and this was so traumatic for her that it drove her to alcoholism. It's also true that this made her not emotionally or probably even physically available for Lillian a lot of the time, and so Lillian was essentially raised without a mother or a father, unless you count Colonel Dijon, and we probably should not count Colonel Dijon. I wasn't able to find any particular screen actresses or play actresses at the time that really matched Ethel's description, and drunken older woman isn't necessarily an archetype of the 1920s. So Ethel may well be our most original character. While she's far gone enough that it's hard to have much sympathy for her within the time period of the Colonel's bequest, I think we can at least agree that she has one of the most tragic pasts, having essentially checked out of life 12 years ago when her husband died and having actually checked out of life tonight when she was hit in the head with a rolling pin. That said, Ethel didn't exactly have a cheerful demeanor. Even before she was drunk, she was shown quarreling with Lillian and suggesting that Gertie didn't deserve any share of the money because she wasn't a blood relation. No word on what she thought about Jeeves, Fifi, or Celie getting a chunk of it, but she probably was not too happy about that either. I'm going to go somewhat out on a limb with Lillian Prune and claim, I have not seen this confirmed anywhere else, that Lillian was at least in part based on Lillian Gish, or Lillian Diana de Gish, born in 1893 in Springfield, Ohio. She had been interested in show business and theater all of her life. In 1902, she made her debut performing in the Little Red Schoolhouse in Rising Sun, Ohio, and toured in 1903 and 1904 in her first false step, a touring play. She would later dance in New York City in 1905, and in 1912 appeared in her first film. This film was An Unseen Enemy, and it was directed by D.W. Griffith, the director who would go on to direct most of the movies that she would show up in. If in the course of learning about some of the starlets of the 1920s, you've noticed that all of them seemed to more or less settle on one director who would direct most of the films that they were in, this was apparently much more common back then. Uh, it was uh, Mr. DeMille with Gloria Swanson, and Clara had a couple, but some of the most common were Adolf Zucker and B.P. Schulberg. In this way, starlet and director or producer teams would be fairly well known to the public. With D.W. Griffith, she went on to become a star and starred in over 25 motion pictures in her first two years. Uh, that's including short films and features. Uh, she was a major star and was known as the first lady of the silent screen. She tended to be in plays that focused on literary works. Somewhat unfortunately for her memory, one of her most famous works was appearing in The Birth of a Nation by Griffith again. This play, some have, well many have condemned as being fairly stereotypical against African Americans. Uh, black people in this film were portrayed by white actors in blackface makeup and being unnecessarily complimentary, some might even say praising the Ku Klux Klan. 
She starred in another picture by Griffith one year later, called Intolerance, which was supposed to combat those rumors, displaying how throughout history intolerance has caused the destruction and collapse of many civilizations. But by that point in time, the damage was fairly well done, and the birth of a nation is remembered much more readily than intolerance. Some people have alleged it was actually responsible for a fairly major resurgence in membership and activity in the clan. She never married or had children, but the association between herself and D.W. Griffith was so close that many suspected that there was some kind of romantic relationship there, and there may have been at least for a little while. However, they, again, never married or even seriously had a dating relationship. She remained very close with her sister Dorothy, who was another actress. Uh, the other thing that's maybe unfortunate about Lillian Gish's legacy is her relatively staunch anti-interventionist take on World War II. She was an active member of the America First Committee, which was an organization funded by General Robert E. Wood with Charles Lindbergh as its leading spokesman. This generally believed that getting involved in World War II and fighting Hitler and the Nazis would be counter to America's interests and that we ought to essentially stay out and focus on defending ourselves first. She was in fact blacklisted by the film and theater industries until she signed a contract in which she promised to stop any anti-interventionist activities and also uh, never disclose the fact that she had agreed to do so. So they essentially ordered her to do a 180 in terms of political beliefs and she actually did so and remained in the silent film. She made a relatively smooth transition to moderate success in talking pictures in the 30s, going back to more stage work as well and appeared frequently in television in the 50s and 60s. She received a special Academy Award, uh, an honorary one essentially, in 1971 for superlative artistry and distinguished contribution to the progress of motion pictures. Her last film role was The Whales of August in 1987 at the age of 93, and in 1993 at the age of 99 on, on February 27th, she passed away of natural causes. She tended to be fairly intense in her film roles. Being a method actress, she would subject herself to periods of extreme heat, cold, and starvation in order to really get into a role. She was well known for suffering in her films, in one especially, the conclusion of the film Way Down East, in which she was shown in the ending scene to be floating down a river on an ice floe towards a waterfall. This is actually a fairly classic scene that gets reused time and time again in pop culture. Well, now you know the origin of it, Lillian Gish. Some of that intensity probably comes through in the character Lillian, which is why I might compare the two. Lillian is the long-suffering, apparently, daughter of Ethel, and therefore niece of Colonel Dijon. She has very fond memories of a childhood spent at Misty Acres Plantation, memories which may in fact be misplaced. The Colonel certainly is unfriendly to her as he is to everyone else, and it's hard to imagine that he was really much more warm and fuzzy even a few years ago, unless we want to say that something like dementia is happening to him. Although he's in his 60s, so that sort of seems unlikely. Since Laura is really incapable of asking follow-up questions to people, all we've heard from a lot of people all night is that we don't know the full story about her, and that she had sort of a hard time. Other people will reference her, sort of colloquially, as being a loony. What I think we can piece together from this is that at some point in time in her life, Lillian had some profound mental illness, and she has been recovering from that. However, this may not be the best situation for her. It's incredibly stressful. There's no one for her to really turn to, except for Laura, who doesn't really do much talking, is mostly snooping around. And one of her most treasured childhood memories, that of kindly Uncle Henri, is essentially being smashed underfoot. Or under wheel, or underfoot and cane, as the case may be. This reached sort of its climax so far when we saw Lillian in a rotting old dollhouse reading the story of Bluebeard to dolls as if they were people. We also know that she had a sort of angry confrontation with Uncle Henri, accusing him of abandoning her and someone else of getting between the two of them. How profoundly mentally ill she is and whether or not she's violent, we will presumably find out in the fairly near future. But for now, all we know is that she's someone to definitely keep an eye on. I hope you enjoyed that look into the two prunes. Ethel and Lillian.